Have you ever tried really hard at something and no matter how hard or long you worked at it, you ultimately failed? Well, that happened to Earth about 200 million years ago when the supercontinent of Pangaea first began to break apart. What many people don't realize is that before the continent spread apart and formed the Atlantic Ocean, it failed first. This failure resulted in the formation of brownstone, one of the most well-known building materials in New York City and New England. We're going to explore the human history of brownstone as well as the geologic one and how those two seemingly separate stories are actually very connected. So first, a little bit of an intro to brownstone. When you think of brownstones, you likely think of New York City or Boston, and that's because of the townhouses or row houses that are made of brownstone. Brownstones aren't fully made of brownstone. They're made of brick usually with a facade of brownstone. And brownstone is actually the colloquial term or like the building material term for the actual name of the type of rock, which we'll get into later. But that's because of the, you know, the rusty reddish brown color. And it became popular, the stone became popular in the 1850s as a building material, 1850s, 1860s, with the rise of romanticism in architecture. So people really valued like earth and nature and they really liked the look of these buildings because it kind of gave them that like earthy tone look. And they also really liked how instead of like a bunch of bricks or a bunch of pieces of rock, they could have like these big slabs of rock on the front of their homes and make it look really seamless. Not everyone loved the look of brownstone though. There's actually this really funny quote by famous writer Edith Wharton where she said brownstone is the most hideous stone ever quarried. So in the 1860s it became more popular and it kept going up 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 as use in building stones and then it became more affordable because of this because more quarries opened throughout New England where the stone was available and more equipment like steam powered equipment was available and used in the quarrying. So once it became more affordable, the more wealthy people kind of weren't interested in it as much because before they were like, oh, this stone is so expensive, so I'm going to use it to build my really expensive house so people know how rich I am. It was like a status of um, a symbol of their wealth. So when it became more affordable, they weren't really interested in it as much because they couldn't really use that stone to show people how rich they were. So that was part of it. It was also the availability of more technology and also the availability of more modern building materials like concrete and steel. So in the 1920s, the use of brownstone kind of died out. So to learn more about this stone and the history of it, I actually went to one of the most famous, if not the most famous quarries that quarried this stone. And it was the Portland Brownstone Quarry in Portland, Connecticut. Hey. I made it to the quarry. I don't know why I'm whispering. Um, yeah, uh, you're sitting on, the camera is sitting on a big slab of brownstone right now. And I just explored and looked at all the cool rocks and it is so much cooler than I thought it would be here. <laughs> like, it's so cool. At one point, about 80% of all brownstone buildings in New York City used stone from this quarry. And they weren't all brownstone townhouses. Lots of other buildings used Portland brownstone, such as St. John's Chapel in Manhattan, which is made out of both brick and brownstone. During the quarry's use, over 5 million cubic yards of brownstone were shipped down the Connecticut River for use as building stone, mostly in New York City. Portland has a long history of quarrying brownstone, starting in the 1600s in this exact quarry. Before brownstone became more widely used in other places, Portland used it to construct a lot of buildings locally, like many of the buildings in Wesleyan University. For example, this is the South College building, which is made up of what looks like a patchwork of different size and shape chunks of the sandstone. Brownstone was also commonly used as a gravestone material. I even went to one of the nearby cemeteries to find some of these older headstones, but I didn't even realize it until afterwards that I had missed the coolest one of all. A botanist named Joseph Barrett had a headstone made of Portland brownstone that had dinosaur footprints on the back of it. Maybe next time. Knowing that where I'm sitting 
dinosaurs used to walk around and this chunk of land that we're on right now used to be pretty much at the equator, I think a little bit north of it. And it used to be a very tropical environment, so it was really warm and humid. And where I am right now, I'm in the Connecticut River Valley, which is also called the Central Valley in Central Connecticut. Um, and it's actually not a river valley. It didn't actually form from a river like the Hudson River Valley did. It formed from being a failed rift, so it's actually a rift valley. Um, and a failed rift is essentially when the continents start splitting apart. So it happened when Pangaea, the supercontinent, which you're probably familiar with, started to break apart. And the failed rift is the part where it was stretched, but it didn't actually break apart. So we're kind of like a little crack from all the tension of Pangaea splitting apart. And it didn't actually break apart where we are now, but there was that big tension that broke it apart and created this big basin in the middle. So where I am right now, if you look at a topographic map, map of Connecticut, in the middle of Connecticut, it's this really flat, lower elevation part of the state. And that's where the Connecticut River does flow through, but that formed later on in the last ice age during glaciation. Um, so the river came much, much, much later, probably around 15,000 years ago, where this rift valley actually formed about 220 to 200 million years ago when Pangaea broke apart. So when that rift valley formed, there were these two big mountain ranges on both sides of it, and that formed lots of alluvial fans from all the sediment falling down those huge, really steep slopes. Think of like the Alps or the Himalayas, really tall mountains. And the, what we see today are still kind of mountains, but they're more like the the roots, the stumps of what mountains used to be there. So those mountains had lots of sediment falling down into this basin and these big alluvial fans, which are pretty much just like big depositions of sediment, they all deposited in that lower elevation area. And that's where all of this sand was deposited and eventually compacted into the sandstone, the brownstone that we see in this quarry. And as you can see, there's a lot, a lot of rock around me. It's really, really thick. And this is only part of it. This is only like a section of the formation. It's a really, really thick formation. So just think of how many layers of sediment had to be deposited in order for all this rock to form. It's kind of hard to imagine. You can see bigger chunks of rock in here. And that's why I think the sandstone is really cool because these eroded off of mountains and since they eroded and deposited so quickly they didn't really have time to sort so in here you see like fragments of other rocks like this looks like a piece of schist maybe and like a piece of feldspar in here and it's just like a big jumble of everything that came off of those ancient mountains that these originally eroded off of, which is pretty cool. So it's no longer an active rift valley, of course, um, but there are active rift valleys on Earth right now, one of them being um, the Baikal Rift Zone, where the, the deepest lake on Earth is. There's also the East African Rift System, which is a really complicated rift valley because it has kind of like three legs of it. Um, that's actually currently turning the Red Sea into an ocean. There's currently um, oceanic crust forming in the Red Sea. So that will eventually be an ocean, just like how the Atlantic Ocean used to be a tiny little sliver of oceanic crust before it opened up into that big wide ocean that we know today. So remember how I said that these rocks formed when sediment was deposited into that basin? This forms what we call a sedimentary rock. Makes sense, sediment, sedimentary. And think of this as books stacked on, on top of each other. Each book has a different story to tell. It can be thinner, it can be thicker, it has different words in it, and it's from a different time period. So you stack those all on top of each other and they each tell you about a different time period in the, you know, in the time period that that sediment was being deposited. So later when that was compacted, say we tape or glue or tie all those books together in a stack, those are going to be together as one big block of books, but eventually if we want to break them apart, they're going to come apart at, you know, the boundaries between each book, between each layer. This is what we call bedding planes in geology. 
each bed of sediment is a different separate layer and there's natural weaknesses in the rock at those the boundaries of those layers so because of this that's actually it really relates to the use of brownstone as a building material and its downfall because what happened is since people loved that look of consistency the seamless look of rocks on their on their houses they would want builders to take the rock the slabs of rock and make them face bedded is what it's called so take this book for example um this this would be the bedding plane right like i just showed you this is the bedding plane it deposited horizontally and then was compacted into rock um and then there's a bunch of them so say i take a bunch of those and that's that's the different um bedding planes of the rock but when they built these buildings they would want the face they wanted to be face bedded so they would want the this side of the rock facing outward so that it had that nice seamless look to it and made the building look really nice and consistent <laughs> they didn't want that look of the different layers of the different inconsistencies with the with the bedding planes and the different sizes of the grains so they usually did that but because of that those natural weaknesses ended up breaking apart a lot of the time and this caused a lot of trouble with the building stones because people are like wait why are these breaking apart why are they weathering so quickly we just built them this is because of frost wedging when water gets in between cracks of a rock and expands when it gets cold and turns into ice and then when it melts again that rock kind of just falls off this is called spalling um, this would happen anyway in the rock, but it happened a lot more than it should have probably because since the rock was so, since the stone was so popular and used so much, they quarried it so quickly that they sometimes didn't have time to like season the rock and let it dry out hopefully. So some of the rock was actually quarried below the groundwater level and it still had that moisture in it when it was added to the buildings. So it already had that water that expanded and then caused the spalling. So that bedding plane, natural texture of the rock is actually part of the reason why people don't really love using brownstone as a building stone because it kind of just broke off. <laughs> and there's a lot of hematite iron ore in there and that's why the brownstone has the reddish brown color because it weathers into that when the hematite iron ore um, oxidizes with water or air from being exposed to all that stuff over time so it's actually not brown on the inside it's only brown when you kind of like cut it open and leave it there for a while think of that like um, an avocado when you cut it open and then you don't eat it all and then you put it in the fridge or on the counter and you come back later and it's like brown that's kind of like what I'm talking about. It's the weathering. The avocado really isn't that color when you cut that weathered slice off of it and see the green again. So the quarry that I'm in right now used to be functional, like it used to be a working quarry. Um, starting in the 1800s to the early 1900s, I think around 1912? 1919? No, I can't remember. Early, early 1900s it um, kind of, the need for brownstone kind of kind of dwindled away. So it was kind of not used as much until the 1990s when a geologist actually bought it and he reopened it in the 90s until it closed again in 2012. And when he owned it, it was actually mainly used for repairs and like restorations. So like he knew that there was a need for the brownstone to be used as like a repair for all the older historic buildings that were built a long time ago during the age of brownstone popularity and this is the original quarry that like a lot of the brownstone came from for those historic buildings so he reopened it and it was in use again for another 20-15 years and now it's this really cool park slash camping area place and apparently a water park which I see people right below me wakeboarding. I really enjoyed learning about this topic and I hope you did as well. 
As a geologist, I love learning about the geologic history of an area or a certain rock formation, but there's something even more fascinating to me about looking at a human-made structure, even an old one in human timescale terms, and seeing millions of years of our Earth's history right in front of me. It's like humans are a bunch of little ants taking tiny grains of sand and moving them into piles for their shelters, not even realizing all the things that had to happen over millions or even billions of years to get into our hands in the first place. In this case, the stone started out as eroded mountains into a basin, but sometimes its origin is an ancient ocean that hasn't existed for millions of years, or a volcano that erupted before trees ever existed on Earth. I have to warn you though, once you start to think about this, you won't be able to go to any town or city without wondering what story lies hidden in the stones around you. Thanks for watching.